good morning. These are my uh, disclosures. So, um, you know, what we want to talk about today are some of the existing newly released therapies, and we'll talk about some of the um, therapies in the drug development pipeline. And I'm going to focus really on four different groups of mechanism of action. Uh, we're going to talk about um, the anti-integrins, so that interaction between the integrins and the adhesion molecules that occur in the uh, vasculature. We're going to talk about the anti-IL-1223 pathway. Uh, we'll talk about JAK inhibitors, the Janus kinase inhibitors. And finally, we'll talk about the uh, sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor, so the S1P uh, receptor modulators. Okay, so lots of different pathways. We're, we're not going to really talk about the TNF only to say, you know, yesterday we talked about the Varsity trial, which was the head-to-head -head trial of adalimumab versus vetalizumab in ulcerative colitis, and that uh, showed an edge in terms of efficacy, both for clinical remission and mucosal healing for uh, vetalizumab. So um, again, to reemphasize that one of the um, interesting um, characteristics of these anti-integrins is the b ability to exploit gut selectivity. Remember we had the um, example of um, natalizumab or Tisabri where it was a very effective Crohn's drug but we were seeing consequences of interactions with the blood-brain barrier and patients were getting progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So that never really, even though it was approved for Crohn's disease in the U.S., it never really caught on. Uh, vetalizumab exploits the fact that you're not just blocking alpha-4, you're blocking alpha-4 beta-7, and that interacts with MADCAM1, which is preferentially expressed in the gut. So anything that you can do to um, interact with that gut selectivity, either alpha, you know, uh, an antibodies to beta-7 integrin or um, other molecules, antibodies to MADCAM itself, you're going to be able to exploit the gut selectivity. So what else is new in vetalizumab besides the Varsity trial? One of the things that's new is we're going to see in the near future a subcutaneous version of vetalizumab. And so this was a study that was published at UEGW as a late-breaking abstract. This was almost 400 patients. All the patients in the study received two IV doses of open-label vetalizumab, the usual dose at week zero and two. But then the patients were randomized either to a sub-Q formulation every two weeks, 108 milligrams, or the usual vetalizumab dose of 300 milligrams IV every eight weeks, or placebo. And the primary endpoint was clinical remission at week 52. That's the standard Mayo score definition of less than or equal to two, with no individual subscore being uh, greater than one. And you can see that the results were positive. Placebo's in the blue. And you can see that the sub-Q formulation was right there with the IV formulation in terms of clinical remission and mucosal healing. And the degree of immunogenicity antibody formation was the same in the two vetalizumab groups. So you're going to see more and more about the vetalizumab sub-Q formulation um, in the future. Etrolizumab. So this is an antibody to beta-7 integrin. So this is not alpha-4 beta-7, just beta-7, but since that's expressed in the gut, it's still going to be gut selective. And some of you may recall this phase two trial in ulcerative colitis showing um, positive results, although you can see that most of the benefit was seen in the anti-TNF naive population, not the anti-TNF exposed population. So. The makers of etrolizumab have a massive phase three development program going on. Those trials are still enrolling. We don't have full results yet. In one of the trials here, this was a UC trial, there was an open label induction cohort. And what the graphs are showing, the solid line is showing rectal bleeding remission, so a rectal bleeding score of zero. And the dotted line is showing a stool frequency remission, which was that the, the score for stool frequency was 
less than uh, one, and you can see that positive results were seen, but this is open label data. Uh, we did see some endoscopic data in that open label portion. 24% had a Mayo score of zero or one, but again, this, this, the, the study hasn't been finalized. We haven't seen the full results. We haven't seen the blinded results yet. Uh, this was a Crohn's trial, um, a proof of concept trial in Crohn's, 300 patients, most of whom were anti-TNF exposed and they were randomized to either placebo or etrolizumab every four weeks or etrolizumab um, at a higher dose at week zero, two, four, eight, and 12. And you can see that uh, the green is placebo, and I apologize, something happened with the slides, but um, you can see favorable trends for the etrolizumab-treated patients and endoscopic improvement uh, also occurred. And so this looks promising. Um, as a drug, and we'll hear more about this. Yet another anti integrin is called uh, abrilumab. This used to be called AMG 181. This is basically a sub Q formulation of an antibody to alpha 4 beta 7 integrin. So it's sort of very analogous in fliximab and Humira. This is sort of the same thing, the relationship between vetalizumab and this drug. And so this was a um, just published in gastroenterology this year. Uh, we participated in this trial, and it was looking at multiple doses of abrilumab. Uh, it met its primary endpoint at the two highest doses, and um, it's, it's a potentially promising drug. Um, most of the benefit, again, was driven in the, um, well, actually, in this study, it was the anti-TNF failure patients also saw uh, reasonable results. And so whether or not this drug gets developed, it's not clear to me, um, for its, but it's not for medical reasons, it's for uh, business reasons. But a lot of drugs out there um, you'll hear about. Here's another one, anti-MADCAM. So this is, instead of alpha-4, beta-7, this is the ligand, MADCAM. This was a drug called PF00547669. It's been renamed because it was bought by a different company, and it's SHP something or other. Anyway, this was also positive in two of the um, doses. This was given subcutaneously as well. This is UC. It was positive in UC. However, they did a trial in Crohn's disease, and technically these results were negative. So there is this theme with some of the anti-integrins that in general, for any given molecule, you tend to see better results in UC than you do in Crohn's disease, and there, there is this uh, theme out there with these drugs. So I'm going to shift gears from uh, anti-integrins to the IL-1223 pathway, and we're all familiar with ustekinumab, which blocks the P40 subunit of IL-12 and IL-23. The other subunit of IL-23 is called P19, and in the diagram I'm showing two molecules. There's actually five different anti-IL-23 molecules being developed for various conditions, uh, three of which are being developed right now for IBD. There's the Medi-2070, which is now known as Brizikumab. There's Rizinkizumab. And then there's another one called Miracizumab. And I'll talk briefly about all three of these. But it's very confusing. So Eustachinumab, first of all, what's new with Eustachinumab? Some of you may have seen at UEGW last year. This was a late-breaking abstract. There was an induction study in moderate to severe ulcerative colitis called the UNIFI trial, and that was a positive trial. It had a very similar design to the induction trials in Crohn's disease. So patients were randomized to either placebo, a 130 milligram IV loading dose, or a loading dose that approximated six milligrams per kilogram. So it was either uh, 260, uh, 390, or 520 milligrams, depending on your body weight. And so then they were assessed at uh, week eight for clinical remission, and this was using um, an adapted Mayo score. And there's, it, I'm happy to talk in the question and answer. There's been sort of a change in what the endpoints are in IBD clinical trials. We can get into that in the Q&A. But in any case, this met its primary endpoint. Both ustekinumab doses were significantly better than placebo, and other endpoints that were met included endoscopic healing, uh, clinical response, 
and endoscopic healing plus histologic healing, and that's going to be the new mucosal healing definition in the label that you have to have both endoscopic and histologic. So um, some of the maintenance data was presented at ECHO. That was also positive. It'll be represented at DDW this year. So in fact, um, some of you may already know that Janssen has already filed for an indication in ulcerative colitis. And so probably by the end of the year or early next year in the U.S., we, we may very well see approval of ustekinumab for um, ulcerative colitis. So getting back to the pure IL-23 drugs, this is brazicumab, which used to be called Medi-2070. Uh, some of the, these molecules, it's hard to keep track because they get sold and bought by different companies. So this has moved from one company to another. It used to be Metamune, and now it's Allergan. Um, this was a proof of concept phase two trial where patients got IV loading dose of brazicumab and then in the maintenance, they were getting sub-Q, so a similar design to the Eustachinumab trials, but this met its clinical endpoint, uh, which was a CDAI response score, but it also um, was a trend towards significance for remission, and it was a trend towards significance for a 100-point decrease in the CDAI score. So this drug is being developed in um, Crohn's disease, and actually, to their credit, they're going to probably be doing a head-to-head -head trial against one of the anti-TNFs uh, or possibly even ustekinumab, uh, rumor has it. So that'll be uh, interesting to see. Rizenkizumab is another anti-IL-23. This is a drug that in psoriasis went head-to-head -head against ustekinumab. And in psoriasis, it was significantly better than ustekinumab, both in terms of efficacy and in terms of safety. And so this holds out the promise that this may be a more effective drug than ustekinumab in Crohn's disease. Of course, we don't know that yet, but this is an early phase two trial, which was positive. Also, again, these anti-IL-23s tend to be IV loading, high doses up front, and then a, a lower dose sub-Q in maintenance. And this, and this uh, trial was positive. The higher dose of risenkizumab studied was significantly better than placebo for uh, virtually all of the outcomes. And so um, this is being developed full bore phase three for both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So you'll be hearing more about this drug in the future. And then the third anti-IL-23 I'm going to talk about is called Miracizumab, and this is actually being studied in ulcerative colitis first as opposed to Crohn's disease. And some of you may have seen these results at DDW last year looking at their phase two results. There was an interesting part of this trial where they used drug levels to change the induction dose as they went along, and if the drug level was below a certain point, they actually escalated the dose. So that was kind of an interesting uh, twist on this trial. But you can see that the, um, it turned out that the middle dose of miracizumab that was studied was significantly better than placebo for ulcerative colitis. So they're going. Uh, full bore into a phase three development program for ulcerative colitis, and also uh, they're starting to look at it in Crohn's disease as well. So that's three different anti-IL-23s that are being developed for inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, the third mechanism of action we're going to talk about are the JAK inhibitors. And I promised yesterday I would talk a little bit about tofacitinib. So JAK inhibitors are interesting because they're small molecules. So these drugs are pills. They can be given orally either once a day or twice a day, depending on the formulation. In the case of tofacitinib, this is twice a day. But these work by interacting with intracellular signaling. So the cytokine... Um, triggers a combination of two jacks, which then phosphorylate the stats, which then work intracellularly and, and affect intracellular uh, signaling. And so different combinations of jacks are associated with different cytokines. It's very complicated, but in general, it's thought that, well, tofacitinib is sort of a pan jack. It hits jack one and jack three, and to a lesser extent, jack two. Then we're going to have some drugs that are pure JAK1s that are going to be developed. There's the thinking that hitting JAK2 
too much may cause more hematologic side effects. And there's a rheumatoid arthritis drug that was studied called baricitinib, which was predominantly JAK2, but that's had some troubles along the way because of adverse events and things like that. And so uh, we're going to, so this just gives you an idea of how many different um, cytokines that the JAKs affect. They don't just hit one thing. They're not targeted to one cytokine. They hit multiple uh, targets. So again, tofacitinib, pan jack, one in three, more than two. Uh, this was the uh, primary induction trials, the octave one and the octave two trials. Uh, they were both significantly better than placebo. You can see there was a 10 point difference between drug and placebo in octave one, and there's a 13 point uh, percent difference in octave two. So this looks pretty good. There's some infection signal. I think the really impressive thing, uh, well, first let's go into this a little bit more. You can see that response rates in induction were very significant. And then the other interesting thing, the graph on the right shows that the, this drug worked whether or not you were anti-TNF naive or anti-TNF exposed. So it works in both populations, which is uh, good to see. But the really impressive results were the maintenance data. So at week 52, you were seeing these enormous deltas, 30 to 40 percent deltas between study drug and placebo for most of the clinical endpoints like response, remission, uh, mucosal healing, and even sustained uh, steroid-free remission. And so uh, this is going to be, you know, small molecule, highly potent. Um, the one issue is going to be safety. So there are some safety issues that has black box warnings for infection and malignancy. In RA, it already has a black box warning. Um, you can see here that infections were higher in the tofacitinib-treated patients. Uh, serious infections were the same, but there's also a specific uh, signal for herpes zoster. So patients that are on the higher dose of tofacitinib, and most patients in the trial ended up on the higher dose, you can see that about five to six percent of the patients get zoster at the higher dose. And so in the U.S., what we're doing in clinical practice is we're getting patients vaccinated with the new recombinant shingles vaccine uh, called Shingrix before we start tofacitinib. So I like to see that they have at least gotten one dose of that two-part vaccination before I start tofacitinib. Um, there were no intestinal perforations. This does cause increase in lipids. Uh, it doesn't appear that this translates into an increased cardiovascular risk, but cholesterol will go up, and occasionally the creatine kinase will uh, go up as well. It did not work in Crohn's disease. So there were two different phase two trials in Crohn's disease. These were both negative maybe some trends towards favorability at the higher doses, but not enough to meet statistical significance. And as far as I know, it's not being developed in Crohn's disease. So tofacitinib approved in UC in the US, not approved for uh, Crohn's disease. However, there are two more selective JAK1 inhibitors that are being developed in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. This was a phase two trial in Crohn's disease called filgotinib. This has been published already in The Lancet. This was a positive study. Uh, remission rates were significantly higher. Uh, response rates were significantly higher as well. They also had some endoscopic response. There was a trend towards favorability, although it didn't quite meet statistical significance. And so this is in a phase three program for Crohn's disease, also in a phase three program for ulcerative colitis. This just shows the endoscopic data. And again, I apologize for some of the slides here. Um, this is an interesting JAK1 inhibitor called upadacitinib. It used to be called ABT-494, now known as upadacitinib. Uh, this, uh, when, when Bill Sanborn presented this at the late breaker session a couple years ago, he said this is the most refractory Crohn's disease population ever uh, studied in a clinical trial. So really emphasize the refractory nature. Most of these patients were anti-TNF refractory. Uh, many of them had been exposed to vetalizumab as well. 
and these were randomized to uh, four different doses of um, ABT-494, and basically it was a proof of concept trial. It met many of the endpoints. It didn't meet all of the endpoints, but it looked like it was a reasonable drug. There were some issues with uh, serious adverse events with the drug compared to placebo, as well as infections. Um, here are some of the co-primary endpoints, and I alluded to this. Most clinical trials in the future are not going to be using the CDAI as the primary endpoint. They're going to have two primary endpoints, one an endoscopic endpoint and one a patient-reported outcome endpoint, so one based on symptoms. So here, endoscopic remission, you can see that for some of the doses it was significant, and then in clinical remission, also for some of the doses uh, it was uh, significant as well. Steroid-free remission uh, looked promising with this drug, and so we're going to see uh, more data. Um, this is U-Achieve, which was presented at UEGW uh, just this past year, and this was the ulcerative colitis data, and this was looking at 250 patients. This is a once-a-day formulation, um, and uh, they met uh, clinical endpoints for the two highest doses. So this is going to be developed further in ulcerative colitis as well. Okay, and then the last mechanism of action we're going to talk about is the S1P receptor modulators. And the idea here is that by modulating this receptor, you're trapping the lymphocytes in the lymph nodes so they don't get out to the periphery and cause inflammation or activate uh, inflammation. And so uh, it sounds kind of like a scary mechanism of action, and I think people were really worried about uh, side effects with this drug, but it, it's proven so far in the IBD trials to be uh, fairly safe. And so this was the touchstone trial, which was a phase two trial in ulcerative colitis, meeting most of the uh, endpoints here, favorable trends, especially at the one milligram dose. And this is the extension trial looking out to week 32, and you can see for most of the endpoints also positive. So it's looking uh, favorable. It's being developed now both in ulcerative colitis and in Crohn's disease. Here's some phase two open label Crohn's data. So I want to stress this is open label, no placebo controlled, no blinding. But you can see that there were um, improvements endoscopically and also by symptoms. And so we're going to be seeing more data in the future. I'm not going to show you a slide, but there are at least two other S1P receptor modulators being developed. One's called etrazomod, and I forget what the third one is called. But uh, lots of interest, as you can see. We're, we're talking, you know, multiple drugs, anti-integrins, multiple anti-IL-23s, multiple JECs, multiple S1P receptor modulators. So. The, the good news is for patients, the, the, the drug development pipeline is very full. So again, the review, tofacidinib is an oral JAK antagonist, highly effective, highly potent in moderate to severe UC, regardless of prior biologic exposure. It does have a black box warning. The UC data looks good so far, but there is a specific herpes zoster risk at the higher dose. We have two oral JAK1 inhibitors, filgotinib and upadacidinib, that look promising in Crohn's disease, and now for upadacidinib ulcerative colitis. We've got multiple anti-integrins, including etralizumab, which looked good in a phase two trial in UC, and some open label induction in phase three, and also for induction of moderate to severe Crohn's. We have an anti-MADCAM antibody, which looked effective in UC, but not in Crohn's. And then we have the anti-IL-23 antibodies, which look good in Crohn's, two of them, and then one of them looked good in ulcerative colitis. And then Ozanamod, the S1P, looked good in ulcerative colitis. And uh, again, there's two more of those in the pipeline. So the future is bright, multiple agents in the pipeline, and so we can reassure our patients that we'll have uh, options for them down the road. Thank you.